Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Uh, well, uh, in the last lecture, we had uh, uh, given the a thought on the role of ritual, religion, and its relationship with ecology by citing uh, some examples, uh, particularly among the Shambhaga tribe in New Guinea. And in that, we have witnessed uh, how ritual, in a way, is being played out in a specific environment and how helpful it is. Now, uh, slightly moving away from what we had discussed in the last lecture, uh, today on this theme, uh, religion in an age of environmental crisis, I am just trying to introduce and brought you to uh, a, a different perspective of bringing in some uh, religion uh, mainly Christian religion, Buddhism and Hinduism and we would be looking at how they have historically tried to make sense of uh, their environment through their religious beliefs. Now, uh, uh, if you look around uh, to set the tone and the background, we would uh, perhaps look into some of the definitions or the opinions which are being raised in the world com by the World Commission on Environment and Development, which uh, perhaps seems to have acknowledged to reconcile with human affairs with natural laws uh, by trying to raise the importance of culture and how these this cultural and spiritual heritages uh, can in some way or the other uh, reinforce or resave or rethink our economic interest and survival imperatives. Now, uh, this sounds quite promising and interesting in some way, but uh, to what extent it is being accepted or how it is being uh, able to be implemented in the practical sense is something which we would be looking on. And uh, for quite some time, uh, the role of this uh, cultural and spiritual heritage, which is mentioned by WCED, is uh, supposedly seen to be something which would be uh, useful for the environmental protection at the same time, uh, sustainable development. But uh, unfortunately, this has been ignored or sidelined by many of the international bodies uh, and the policy planners and uh, uh, <coughs> even many of the environmentalists. Now, uh, one of the main anxiety and fear which uh, these communities or these organizations have felt was in some way if uh, the cultural and the spiritual aspect is being brought into the domain of uh, environment and uh, sustainable development, it might in some way uh, tends to compromise with the rationality of science. And uh, as I said, many tends to be pretty much apprehensive of uh, trying to ushering in these ideas of religions or the classic texts in the uh, sphere of this environmental movement, which perhaps is seen to be a threat because uh, it, 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 they might compromise the objectivity and uh, the scientific temperament and professionalism of or, or so to say the democratic values. So, for this reason, for quite some time, 
this idea of religion is being sidelined if not ignored. Now, uh, this idea of rejection also led some groups of uh, communities to even uh, lead to a complete rejection of religion to even uh, incorporate them in the domain of this environment. And similarly, the issue was being raised by some of the recent feminist critic of religion, which perhaps identified these uh, patriarchal biases, which is seen to be more close to the Western science, or, or perhaps which is more uh, led by the Western patriarchal capitalist development. So, therefore, these are some of the issues which, which perhaps has been witnessed and encountered even, even after the ideas which is posited by the WCED to incorporate this religious and uh, spiritual heritage. Now, if you uh, try to contextualize uh, uh, historically, religion in a way uh, tends to, you know, not only teach us to perceive and to act on, on the non-human nature in terms of uh, the particular human interests, beliefs and social structures. But this might not necessarily be the case with every religion. So therefore, we will we'll try to look at some of the uh, claims and counterclaims uh, which are seen in the classic uh, text of many religious books uh, in the upcoming lectures. Now, uh, true religions, uh, myths and laws have in a way, uh, we have socialized nature and, and, and harming it uh, or maybe we, we tend to situate or contextualize them in our own human terms. That is the way we perceive, the way we maintain the kind of relationship and the way we uh, sort of uh, meted out certain kind of actions or maybe let us say harming them. Now, and to a large extent, we have in a way uh, done so far as so to satisfy our basic human needs or rather greeds and abilities and power relations. Now, uh, for, for, for quite some time, um, when we talk about the sustainability, the question is to what extent the resources we have encounter uh, are in a position to satisfy our needs rather than our grids. But we all know that the human uh, needs in a way is unlimited and we yearn for more and more. and. As a result of this, we tend to engage in exploiting the resources in the, a large extent. Now, the question remains, how far this uh, religion shape our understanding and also our conduct towards nature? And the second question is, and how has this environmental crisis what we are facing currently challenge and transform modern theology and spiritual practices. Now, these are some pertinent questions which perhaps can be raised and it is also interesting to look at how uh, the kind of religious beliefs or teaching is also being shaped by the uh, cultural and social environment to which it is being uh, shaped. Now, therefore, religion in a way is not something we tend to follow whatever is being included in the religious or the classic text. Rather, we humans tend to frame a religion in our own ways and then in our own uh, interest. So, therefore, uh, when we talk about the Christian religion in particular, uh, since it is being borrowed and then it has its origin from uh, the Western culture. So, that part of the Western culture influencing on the Christian religious teaching in a way is 
seem to be uh, something different from what it is being interpreted from the classical uh, biblical texts. Now, now for instance, if you look at the portion on the classic text of uh, the Genesis that is the first part of the Bible, uh, it, it many writers in a way uh, quote these particular words in order to have uh, some kind of a debate if not their uh, disagreements. Uh, uh, man's rights that is to master the art that is how human is given some kind of inalienable rights to uh, control or if not uh, you know uh, act in a way what they like on this earth and or, or more, more, more importantly the surroundings and this perhaps since seem to have created uh, uh, an essential source of uh, havoc which wrecked by the western societies upon the earth. Now, as we all know how uh, industrialism and capitalism evolve and emerge and uh, in, in one of my lectures I had also mentioned about how the Christian religion or the Protestant ethic is particularly responsible for the rise of this uh, western capitalism. Now, uh, in some way uh, these all add ups and then the kind of culture bring or upbringing where one comes from uh, in a way has an impact that is the religious belief in a way has an impact or impinges upon the character and uh, attitudes and behavior of human towards nature. Now, contrary to what it is being seen here in the religious text. Uh, we could also uh, find out a different issues here that is the spread of democracy and also the critical intellectual tendencies which are embedded in the enlightenment philosophy and modern science also caused heavy doubt uh, on any particular religion's claims to absolute truth. Now, when we looked at the period of this enlightenment which is more or less based on scientific reasons and it, it tends to debunk the whole idea of religious belief and, uh, and these religious beliefs are seen to be a myth and irrational and uh, which are uh, seen to be unscientific. Therefore, uh, the spirit of this enlightenment and uh, philosophy and modern science in a way has sort of create a serious doubt on the particular religion's claims to absolute truth. Now, uh, the ideas or the belief which is based primarily on this religion is seen to be uh, something which is which cannot be proven and which is not based on reason. Therefore, it, it, it cannot be accept it cannot be accepted as an absolute truth. Now, uh, this idea of uh, how modern science and technology emerges together in a way has to some extent shaped not just uh, a new uh, way of perceiving the earth or the universe, but it in a way has sort of uh, brought a negative changes to the uh, geographical space where humans tends to uh, sort of uh, exploit the nature uh, much more in a much more intensity. Now, uh, similarly uh, there are also in the recent times the eco theologians who tends to you know uh, brought in uh, this idea of these traditions or, or let us say uh, the cultural beliefs and then certain other uh, ideas uh, which are enshrined on the classical texts uh, tends to uh, attempt made an attempt to sort of reinterpret so that uh, which, which, which can perhaps help us 
uh, in, in solving this current crisis which we are facing uh, the in, the in the in the current uh, environmental context. Now, uh, the eco theologians for that matter uh, tries f tries or attempts to bring in certain religions. So, that we in a way have uh, certain kind of beliefs which can uh, be useful in, in, in trying to drive the humans uh, closer to nature, which perhaps has begun as uh, it was in the past, but it, it, it has dramatically changed over time, uh, perhaps because uh, human tends to be led by the materialistic desire and then so is the relationship between human and the environment or natural resources has changed uh, drastically. Uh, therefore, in fact, if the significance of this religion is uh, sort of increased uh, because of these several guiding lights of uh, modernity have become increasingly suspected. Now, uh, uh, for, for instance, uh, people tend to have that negative notion against who are being religious or, or, or terming them as rather fanatics or radicalist or maybe fundamentalist. Now, therefore, even among the same faith or the same religion, there is this sort of antagonistic feeling among humans. Now, keeping aside that uh, even the faith in science and these materialists or these uh, so called uh, liberal democracies has in a way been undermined by the uh, political violence, technological disasters and culture bankruptcy uh, in the late 20th century that is in the post second world war. Now, if you looked at that is purely from the uh, secular radical politics point of view, it in a way have rendered uh, some kind of uh, doubtful uh, mainly by the kinds of economic failures and also the uh, totalitarian political ex uh, excesses of this communism. This in a way have tends to see uh, the failure of the political affairs around the world, how the communism have failed and how totalitarian has in a way has not been able to deliver what it promises. And uh, this sort of chaos and the kind of anarchism which is being witnessed uh, has in a way uh, led to certain kind of an economic uh, disaster. Now, therefore, uh, this spiritual perspective uh, is sort of seen as an alternative way uh, or maybe as a source of some kind of a social directions as well as a personal inspiration. Now, uh, this religion as I said uh, can in a way deliver some kind of uh, interest if not uh, an alternative way with, with from all these chaos and uh, problems which, which we have witnessed today. And now, from the perspective of many world religions that is on the abuse and exploitation of nature, for human immediate gain is perhaps perceived to be sort of unjust, immoral and unethical. Now, for example, uh, if you look back at history that is the ancient past particularly the religion like in the Hindus and Buddhists, where in a way uh, observed to be you know more careful uh, and, and then they, they, they are more or less engaged with the moral teachings uh, regarding their uh, attitudes towards uh, nature that is uh, plants and animals normally. And even the many of their leaders that is their rulers and the kings, uh, were in a way uh, uh, pretty much uh, followed the kind of principles and guidelines and, and also in a way they have uh, created an example to their fellow subjects and citizens. Now, uh, for instance, you can perhaps uh, maybe highlight uh, 
uh, the great king Asoka, wherein he sent violence uh, after the war of Kalinga and uh, the followers that is uh, he took up the religion or the professed the religion of Buddhism and uh, he later on becomes to be uh, pretty much well known uh, missionary of Buddhism. Now uh, that, that sort of extreme steps which are normally being taken up and, and for that matter like uh, the religion of this Buddhism in a way uh, is founded by none other than the Prince Siddhar that is who later on came to be known as Gautama Buddha who in a way has spent uh, much part of his life in the forest or closer to nature and, and therefore there are some uh, living examples or maybe uh, legends whom we can in a way pinpoint of how uh, they are in a way able to set certain kind of examples uh, in the past, in the distant past, uh, particularly even in the Indian context. But now, if you look around, uh, maybe particularly in the 20th century, this ideas or this attitude of this materialistic uh, uh, orientation, uh, which is more or less being influenced by the Western culture, has equally affected the cultures of the East. That is, it has in a way not only influenced uh, through this process of this modernity, modernization or the globalization process, this whole idea of uh, Western culture has not, I would not say indoctrinated, but then uh, to some extent has influenced the cultural behavior and then attitudes of uh, the East to some extent. So, more or less the modern science of uh, which is purely occidental in a way has uh, sort of uh, have an impact on the orient that is the orientalist. Now, uh, therefore, this uh, theme on the historical roots of our ecological crisis which is pretty much uh, uh, propagated or uh, strengthened by none other than the, the historian uh, Lynn White. Lynn White in a way tries to look at uh, or trace the genealogy of or the historicity of religion by bringing in the Judeo-Christian religion in trying to look and locate how it in a way has evolved and uh, the kind of relations between human and nature has changed drastically over a period of time. Now, uh, what he tries to look at or locate is this uh, injunction or the kind of uh, alliance which is being seen between the science and technology uh, that is the theoretical and the empirical approaches to our natural environment has to some extent uh, drastically changed that is beginning from the enlightenment period and uh, uh, how this western science or the modern science is seen to be sort of the only answer to our uh, problems. And, and whereas sidelining the other beliefs or principle as something which is illogical and irrational. Now, uh, this emergence of uh, the widespread of these practices of uh, the Baconan creed that scientific knowledge means technological power over nature can in a way scarcely be dated before the 1850 that is the uh, 19 the mid 19th century. Now, these ideas of uh, how the scientific knowledge or western science is seems to be much more dominant and then much more powerful or uh, or in terms of uh, against dominating the nature in a way has uh, sort of uh, shape our ideas or our attitude towards nature. For example, uh, if you look at the inventions and the evolutions of even uh, arms and ammunition for instance, when the, the first cannon was fired that is way back in the early 14th century you could perhaps imagine the kind of far-reaching impact it has on the ecology. 
or the environment rather. How and to what extent the natural resources has been uh, exploited by simply uh, using this first cannon. You all know like uh, what a cannon is made of. It is not just an iron, but also the kind of ammunition which is being required and the amount of sulfur and charcoal which is being required in order to you know build a cannon. Now, therefore, superseding all these uh, surpassing all these ideas of how these uh, the evolution of arms and ammunition in a way has to some extent uh, tends to not only uh, lead to the ecological disaster, but also uh, it has to some extent uh, and to a very innumerable extent it has led to a deforestation. Now, this in a way has led to some certain kind of erosion and also deforestation, because the demand for this iron ore and charcoal or sulfur rather, uh, which is being mined from the forests or from the mountains has been uh, in much more demand. Therefore, it, it, it has to some extent uh, affected the environment uh, in a great uh, manner. Now, uh, how is this alliances between uh, the science and technology is uh, to be perceived. Science which was uh, traditionally uh, perceived to be much more aristocratic in the sense it is, it is more uh, based on the control or the dominance of the elites and then which was uh, more of speculative also and intellectuals in intent. Whereas, technology was uh, more of uh, lower class or empirical and action oriented. Now, when we talk about technology uh, before the alliance between science and technology, technology has in a way uh, in existence in a much much more earlier period than the, the first form of boats of production like the simple technology of plowing and so on and so forth. And, and, and as a result of uh, the its injunction and alliance with science, technology has become much more finer and finer. And this evolution of technology itself has to be seen and located in the context of how harmful and uh, impactful it is in the uh, for the environment in general. Now, this fusion of the science and technology uh, which, which happened towards the middle of the 19th century that is after the ideas of this Baconian Crete of the scientific knowledge uh, which is seen to be uh, dominance over nature. Now, uh, this sort of fusion between science and technology has in a way reduced the kind of social barriers which tended to sort of uh, assert a functional unity of brain and hand. Now, earlier uh, it was more of uh, you know an empirical or an action oriented uh, and, and, and it was uh, very less guided by the sort of uh, rationality or maybe uh, it, it was more based on uh, logic rather than uh, the intellectual intent. Now, with the fusion of the science and technology, now uh, people stand to use not just the hand, but the brain. And this sort of uh, combination happens to be pretty much lethal and which eventually have witnessed and resulted to the ecological crisis, which we are facing now. Now, this eco ecology crisis in a way is a product of an emerging entirely uh, novel and democratic culture. Now, therefore, if one looked at how does one tries to contextualize uh, the historical roots of this that is the ecology crisis which we are facing. One can perhaps uh, not just uh, go back to the fusion or the injunction between science and technology. But uh, since the theme which we are discussing is uh, primarily based on uh, 
uh, religion will try to pick how some religion in a way influences or are able to bring certain kind of uh, changes in terms of human relations towards nature. Now, uh, uh, before adding on that, uh, if you look at the uh, western traditions of this technology and science, uh, more or less this the modern technology which we are using and the modern science are perceived to be uh, distinctively occidental is that is uh, western in nature. Now, uh, and uh, as this technology and science which begin from the west in a way also has uh, being influenced by the western ideas of understanding or perceiving nature and uh, therefore, the leadership of the West that is the western world both in terms of technology and in science and also uh, in far older than the scientific uh, revolutions of the way back in the 17th century or the so called industrial revolution of 18th century and how it is able to usher in uh, this amount of uh, changes in terms of uh, not just the scientific revolutions, but also the industrial revolution and to what extent this industrial revolution has changed the uh, face of the world or the art rather. And, uh, and as a result of this industrial, why is industrial revolution always important when we looks at the advancement of this modern science and technology, because as a result of this industrial revolution, uh, it in a way has resulted to the uh, colonizing more and more countries and for quite some the period beginning from the 18th century till the later part of the 20th century is uh, seen to be more of a period of uh, imperialism and this colonialism, how the western countries were in a way in competition to colonize uh, a country, so that uh, they were not just politically, but economically, economically subjugated and their natural resources are being ushered into their country. Now, therefore, this idea of this western tradition in a way by uh, having the upper hand with the use of this technology and science can be in a way seen to be uh, rather uh, in a different context. Now, if you look at the idea of this uh, the, the medieval view of men and nature that is much more before how this uh, the advancement of this modern science takes place. Now, uh, agriculture perhaps uh, happens to be one of the main chief occupation uh, even in the present times, but then any change in the method of uh, the use of technology or tillage has a far reaching uh, impact uh, on the kind of how we use uh, the soil. Now, agriculture uh, for quite some time as I said uh, not just in the present context, but happens to be the first form of uh, how human sustenance uh, naturally uh, begin. Now, if you look at the earlier forms of how this agriculture is operated, people tend to use the uh, plows which were normally being drawn by uh, animals that is maybe couple of oxen and which did not normally uh, have uh, much of you know an impact on the soil and only the upper crust or layer of the art is being scratched uh, by uh, this use of this particular tools or the early plow let us say. Now, by uh, later part of the 7th century AD that is uh, particularly in Europe or maybe the northern countries normally, 
peasants were uh, using much more of uh, a new kind of plow, which is perhaps seen to be more equipped with uh, a vertical uh, knife or uh, a tool, uh, which, which in a way can uh, cut the line of the furrow, that is the soil. And, and the friction of this particular plow with the soil uh, was so uh, impactful that it normally require uh, maybe uh, half a dozen or maybe eight oxen, which is particularly different from the earlier one when they used this uh, the plow which is being uh, reckoned by the maybe two oxen. Now, therefore, the more number of uh, these animals are being required and uh, since people can't afford uh, uh, such kind of uh, this the new kind of plow. So, they, they, they normally tends to pull together and then uh, go on with this kind of uh, agriculture practices. Now, in this what is being witnessed is that it tends to have uh, a certain kind of uh, impact on the land to such uh, an extent that the cross plowing was not uh, actually needed and the field standard to be set in a long strips and uh, how uh, acres and acres of land were being plowed. Uh, in a period of a uh, few moments. Now, what we can see from uh, this context is that the kind of uh, land how it was being distributed earlier that is the fields were normally uh, distributed in units that is which, which were more of, more of capable of supporting a single family that is more or less based on subsistence and uh, subsistence farming was perhaps the regular practice and uh, in that period of time. Now, as we had discussed how the use of these uh, the more, more much more of a sharp blade in terms of the harmful of those things, a new and more efficient plow that is peasants tends to you know uh, uh, pulling together their oxen to form a large plow teams. Now, therefore, this distribution of land uh, was no longer based on the kind of how the family can afford or rather based on the needs of the family, but uh, based on the capability or capacity of a power machines to deal the art that is those who are in possession or who are in, 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 in a position to own uh, a machine in a way can till the land uh, to the extent they possibly want it. Now, therefore, it is not based on the family owning such a such ratio of land, but rather if somebody is in a position to possess uh, you know a powerful machine, he in a way can own much more of a land. Therefore, this uh, there is disparities in terms of distributions of land at the same time uh, in terms of accruing and possession of wealth. Now, that is uh, sort of a, a background how uh, humans relationship with the soil has uh, in a way a profoundly changed and also how uh, uh, the earlier forms that is when the simple technology was used man was seen to be much more closer to nature or has been part of nature and rather evolve and emerge as uh, an exploiter of nature that is uh, how uh, man eventually took uh, not just something which is dependent on but rather become a master that is how the back on end of the scientific knowledge in a way also shape the minds of humans that is uh, the dominance or power over nature is being 
uh, witness uh, way back from the uh, 17th century. Now, what people do about uh, their ecology, the kind of actions or attitude which are which are being meted out uh, to the environment also normally depends on what uh, we think about themselves that is in relations to things around them. That is usually how uh, we perceive ourselves in relations to uh, things around them that is the ecosystem. Now, in a way uh, we have at length uh, discussed about uh, the human ecology already. So, I need not uh, really go into deep details again. Uh, human ecology as we discussed is normally deeply conditioned by the beliefs about our nature and the destiny that is by religion. Now, in the context of this human ecology again religion plays an important role. Now, therefore, how the emergence of this Christianity or this Christian religion by trying to discard uh, this idea of this uh, non Christian or the pagan belief maybe uh, as we discuss uh, what uh, Durkheim talk about in the, the elementary forms of religion of how this totemism is uh, becomes a symbol totem becomes a symbol of a particular community. These sorts of beliefs on totemism or maybe animism or animistic belief is in a way discarded or being sidelined by uh, the Christian religion. Now, the victory of this Christian religion over this paganistic belief was perhaps seems to be seen to be much more of uh, you know a psychological revolution in the history of our culture that is uh, that is the post Christian age. Now, uh, it, it tends to discard the kind of uh, beliefs which, which hover around in many different parts of uh, the societies and different religious groups. And what, what is the kind of uh, impact and result uh, Christianity has brought about uh, in terms of the kind of relations people share with their environment. Uh, since, since they denounce the kind the existence of uh, supernatural forces, the ideas of how spirits, spirits dwells in certain uh, animate and inanimate objects. So, all this happens to sort of denounce and discard the earlier beliefs and the kind of relations people share with their environment. Now, if you look at the stories of creation, that is how, uh, how Christianity in a way uh, is being inherited from uh, uh, Judaism not only as a concept of time, but also as uh, more of non repetitive and linear. Now, earlier uh, many of the uh, native societies tends to perceive uh, uh, the concept of space and time as more of cyclical in nature, but then the Christian dogma which is based on this idea of uh, uh, more, more or less based by uh, influenced by the western science tends to perceive time as which is linear which, is, which, which, which moves on that is non repetitive. And so is their ideas of this uh, creation. And although uh, it is mentioned in the Genesis that is the first book of uh, the Bible. Uh, God happens to create the humans in his own image and body. Uh, he is not simply part of uh, the art or the nature, but he is made in God's image. Now, if you look at these ideas of the stories of creation, uh, we can in a way uh, look at how uh, over a period of time, human tends to you know perceive themselves as above nature. That is uh, one of the reasons why uh, uh, Lynn White in a way tends to perceive this uh, 
Christianity, it, which is being influenced by the Western culture, or maybe in its Western form as something uh, which is seen to be uh, one of the most anthropocentric religions uh, the world has seen. I am sure by now you are uh, familiar with uh, this terminologies of anthropocentric and biocentric. Uh, the anthropocentric uh, uh, perceive uh, humans to be at the center of this uh, universe and which in a way uh, is not uh, sharing a sort of a biocentric relations, but rather has a sort of an overriding power over the other species or rather the ecosystem. Therefore, uh, human is being situated above nature. Now, Christianity uh, in its absolute uh, terms can be seen to be contrast to the ancient paganism and Asius religious except perhaps the maybe Zoroastrianism. Not only establishes uh, a dualism of man and nature, but also insisted that it is God's wills that man exploit nature for his proper ends. So, in a way, they, they Christians tend to perceive or justify their uh, sort of action towards nature by uh, being guided by that opinion of that uh, to exploit nature for one's uh, needs is perhaps seems to be uh, you know quite justified in that sense. But uh, the pace and the amount of this exploitation which is taking place uh, at the current pace is not something which is seen to be uh, you know balanced and then uh, sustainable in the real sense. Now, by destroying this uh, the pagan animism, Christianity in a way emerges or has an upper hand in terms of you know, exploiting the nature in a mood of indifference to the feelings of natural objects. So, in a way it is guided by these ideas of temperaments or feelings of how these natural objects can be sort of uh, exploited uh, to the extent what once uh, like uh, uh, in, as, as the human tempo and uh, interest. Now, this religious study in a way uh, of nature for the better understanding of God was known as uh, sort of categorized as a natural theology. Now, in the early church if you look at uh, mostly uh, in the medieval period and always in the Greek East, nature was perceived to be uh, uh, primarily as something which is symbolic. That is their closeness and the kind of proximity they share with the plants and animals. And, and they, it, is, it is through this nature or maybe uh, God in a way tends to you know uh, convey certain kind of message to them. Now, therefore, a certain kind of plants and animals are sort of being revered and then seen to be uh, sacred. Now, therefore, uh, in, in, in the context if you look at the Greek mythology event, uh, there are some animals and then plants which are uh, sort of uh, acting as a totem to the Greek society. Now, this view of uh, nature was essentially artistic rather than scientific. Now, as uh, with the emergence of these uh, scientific revolutions and uh, the industrial revolution, these ideas or perceptions or views about nature was in a way being rejected and then seen to be uh, much more guided by these ideas of artistic or maybe arts and aesthetics. Now, Western science in a way uh, tends to presume that the task and reward of these scientists was to in a way think God's thought after him and leads ones to believe that 
this was their real motivation. Uh, so in a way, uh, they tend to the Western science in a way uh, uh, presume that uh, they are in a way fulfilling uh, the kind of the unfulfilled desires or works which are being in a way left by uh, if you go by the creation stories how the art is being created. Now, this modern western science was cast in the matrix of this Christian theology. It, it was sort of a mixture wherein this western science was injected uh, into the Christian theology and uh, tends to sort of being perceived as uh, a propagator. Now, this both science and technology in a way are sort of blessed uh, words in the contemporary uh, or this modern world. Uh, firstly, because that view historically that modern science is an extrapolation of uh, natural theology and secondly that uh, modern technology is at least partly to be explained as uh, which is based on the western culture that is occidental and also voluntary realization of the Christian dogma of man's transcendence of that is uh, the rightful mastery of a nature that is purely guided by the anthropocentric ideas. Now, science and technology which we have uh, in a way uh, are being grown out of uh, is being uh, sort of indoctrinated by the Christian attitudes uh, and, and their preachings and teachings towards man's relation to nature, who in a way is fondly also regarded as the post Christians. Now, uh, let us uh, quickly have a look at uh, the kind of worldview or the uh, Christian cosmology rather. Now, uh, to a Christian, a tree can be uh, no more than a physical fact. That is something which is uh, which which have in a way a uh, utilitarian purpose, and uh, the intrinsic ideas of a tree is normally being sidelined and compromised. So this whole concept of the sacred growth is alien to Christianity and to the ethos of the West. Now this sacred growth in a way is in practices in many of the uh, animistic societies, wherein the, they believe that there is a spirit which dwells in the tree and then or maybe certain kind of mythical beliefs are being embedded in that particular forest and which is therefore considered to be sacred. Now, this idea in a way is again rejected by this Christian belief. Now, for nearly this uh, two millennia, that is, the Christian missionaries have, in a way, engaged in sort of uh, discarding and driving out uh, those uh, sort of spirits which are seen to be, you know, ill and demilled from those sacred groves and which are, in a way, seen perceived to be idolatrous because they assume spirit in nature. Now, therefore, uh, this whole idea of you know the practices of chopping down or deforestation in a way also has uh, an impinge on the environment or the ecology rather. Now, uh, I had also partly mentioned about the kind of uh, economic practices which are in a way being guided by this uh, the western uh, Christian values. So, I won't repeat that. Now, the question is what we do about ecology essentially depends on our ideas of these main nature relationship. How? Because uh, the more we engage or tends to you know like uh, depend on the science and technology, we are not going to you know uh, move out of this or rather uh, evacuate ourselves from this ecologic crisis until a new kind of religion is 
being established or rethink of the old world. So, in a way uh, Lynn White's argument basically is not to uh, debunk or distort Christian religion in principle, but the kind of injection where the western culture or the western science and technology is being impregnated or maybe inject injected with Christian theology is something which needs to be you know uh, differentiated. So, therefore, one needs to you know deconstruct and then reconstruct the whole ideas of this uh, Christian religious teaching. This is what uh, Lynn White's uh, basic argument is if I understand him correctly. Now, but our present uh, science if not our present technology perhaps seems to be uh, teacher with uh, the orthodox Christians uh, arrogance towards nature and therefore, no solution seem to be you know near to our ecologic crisis which can soon be expected. Uh, therefore, the roots of our trouble are uh, largely based on religion and uh, the remedy in a way also perhaps essentially can be uh, religious in nature. So, the idea is to build an alternative part or if not an alternative ways of understanding or perceiving uh, religion uh, in, in, in general by uh, pointing out the Christian religion in uh, particularly. Now, uh, to know more about uh, uh, Lynn White's uh, understanding, maybe you can refer this, uh, the historical roots of our ecological crisis, uh, which was published way back in 1967, in which you can have a uh, much more broader understanding about the critical argument which is being posed by Lynn White by challenging not just Christian religion, but also uh, the western science and technology, how it is uh, you know evolving and then in a way led to the ecological crisis which we are facing now.